Welcome to the third AGU-sponsored Carlos Sagan uh, webinar. Uh, my name is Dennis Ojima. I'm a senior scientist at the Colorado State University. Um, this discussion series uh, was organized to delve into more depth in the career path of the Sagan lecturer. And this year's Sagan lecturer is Compton James Tucker III. We have conducted webinars um, on the Sagan legacy, uh, on the emergence of remote sensing capabilities um, to research um, of the Earth system. And today's topic, we'll hear from professors Inez Fung from UC Berkeley and Scott Denning from Colorado State University um, on the developments that led to the incorporation of the carbon cycle into Earth system models and how Tucker's contributions um, contributed to these advances. Before we um, have Inez and Scott um, give a short presentation each, um, I'd like to just give you a little bio sketch um, for them. Inez Fung is a professor of atmospheric sciences at the University of California, jointly appointed in the Department of Earth and Planetary Science um, and the Department of Environmental Science Policy and Management. She's also co director of the Berkeley Institute of the Environment, um, a, a member of the National. Academy of Sciences and for member of the Royal Society in the UK, as well as in the Chinese, the Ty, is it the Ty, Taiwan? Chinese? No, I think that's it's Taiwan. Dennis, that's fine. Taiwan. I had a grand time learning from everyone. I'm a mathematician by training, and Jim Tucker led me into a whole new world of ecology. <laughs> so, so, so the so I think that's all right. Thank you. And Scott Scott Denning is a professor in atmospheric science department and Montfort professor at Colorado State University. Um, he served as director of education for the Center for Multi-Scale Modeling of Atmospheric Processes, a, a very large and major um, NSF-funded center um, from for a decade from 2006 to 2015. He's also lead scientist for the NASA project on um, the OCO, the Orbiting Carbon Observatory. Um, he has studied radiometric um, geochronology, surface water geochemistry, mountain hydrology, uh, before um, entering the field of global climate and biogeochemical dynamics. Um, he received his PhD here in atmospheric science department um, at Colorado State University in 1994. Um, so with with those introductions, I'm going to turn it over to um, Inez um, and have her um, give a short presentation. Okay, thank you. So, are you showing my screen? You should be have a you should have a little toggle. In yes, the control you your screen. Control your yes. Screen. Is my screen on the there? Yes. Okay, so I can so that's great. So I'm going to talk about the NDVI um, and the global carbon cycle. And obviously, uh, you can see Jim Tucker is a graduate student doing the field work. But, Carl, but um, Jim started, Tucker started talking about Carl Sagan. Um, Carl Sagan um, worked for Melvin Calvin when he was a graduate student. He, was a, he came to UC Berkeley. And then he was the first, he, wa he was also a postdoc here. And what I have included here is his paper uh, while he was a postdoc on the origin and planetary distribution of life. So it's not just Carl Sagan doing the billions of billions of stars out there, but on, the, on, on life. And he, and in the paper, he referenced Melvin Kelvin, and all of you know the Kelvin for cycle of photosynthesis. So I'm going to talk about three things. The first is the seasonal cycle of CO2. So you can see here, this, this is from when we started, from 1982. You, uh, you can see how far we've gone in the CO2 concentration. So there's a, there's a repeated annual cycle. The peak is in, the, the, the peak concentration is in May and the lowest concentration is in October. Sorry, so, um, something happened here. Um, so, when we did that, um, so here, so when we started modeling this in the 3D, in the, in the three-dimensional model, there were no data. 
So what I did was assume that the growing season, we sat there and say, when do we get our allergies? And so, and then the decay season, we call the rot function, was just a little bit longer when you go hiking, there's still stuff on the ground. And so what you see here, the early, early papers, that the, that the, what the atmosphere feels is only about 20% of the, of the flux in one direction. So then came along, and then came, here came Jim Tucker with the NDVI. So you can see here on the right-hand side that the relative concentration of CO2 versus the global NDVI, that there's a decrease. So this is the photosynthetic. So when NDVI is high, there is a high, there's a photosynthetic uptake of CO2 from the atmosphere. So the paper starts with this sentence, terrestrial photosynthesis is inversely proportional to atmospheric carbon dioxide concentrations and is important component of the global carbon cycle. I have to tell you to this day, uh, Graham Farquhar cannot get past that sentence. <laughs> that photosynthesis is, would increase in his, fa in, in, his, in his space, photosynthesis would increase with carbon dioxide and not inversely proportional. So, so we're talking about the atmospheric view versus the biological view. And this is something that, that when we get together from different disciplines, something that the sign convention is something we need to work through. So here is the, the, the NDVI. So for the first time, we actually from, have from the observations here from North Pole to South Pole and over the first three years of the NDVI, you can see higher NDVI at mid-latitudes in the summer months repeatedly, high NDVI in the tropics, and then the NDVI in the southern hemisphere is out of phase with the northern hemisphere. So this is very, very nice. So we can, we can overlay then the atmospheric CO2 data, but this is only the, these lines, it's just the negative um, CO2 when, there's, when CO2 is decreasing in the atmosphere. So it, it, the timing of it overlays on top, right on top of the NDVI. So I think we're off to the races. So that I think by now you all know that the NDVI is some, me some measure of the photosynthetic capacity and it's related to what, well, what we now call the breathing of the biosphere. The second thing, second topic I want to cover is what else can the NDVI do? So, so say I put here, try vegetation classification. So most of us are used to different ways of classifying vegetation. There's the taxa species, you have kingdom, subkingdom, et cetera, et cetera. And for me, it's always difficult to get through all the Latin names. So then there's another way, which is the, the UN, way, FAO, which is physiognomical structure. So you can see the formation class, subclass, etc. You have closed forests, you have mainly evergreen forests, you have tropical, umbrotrophic, umbrophallus, uh, lowland forest, etc. So this is this is what they look like. You have tall grass, short grass, etc. And then there's also the bioclimatic and the CO2, the bioclimatic classification which is something that we use in the climate model to, pres to prescribe boundary condition. So the, this habitat, what temperature precipitation is preferred. So the question is, what does the, so can the, what can, can the NDVI contribute to that conversation? But what does, but before that we have to say, what does the NDVI measure? So this is a slide Jim Tucker gave me a long time ago. So here on the left, you see the vegetation index, the NDVI versus leaf water content. And Jim wrote that the leaf content, the leaf water content in grass is the best and easiest measure of the green leaf biomass and is very highly correlated with chlorophyll content. So here is a picture of the three stooges. So normalized difference. So here Jim wrote uh, the sim simple transform, sorry, the simple transform normalized for the intensity. So here you have the infrared plus the red. Intensity is directly related to leaf biomass and what else? So all these are correlative studies. 
So Jim gave me this particular slide. So here is the NDVI, but here on the y-axis is the photosynthetically active uh, radiation. And so what the NDVI is really measuring is not photosynthesis or water content, but it's actually the absorbed photosynthetically active radiation or the photosynthetic capacity. So now we get back to the vegetation classification. So then with the NDVI, then we can use an energetic classification. So you can divide the, the land cover, uh, trees or shrub or herbaceous or bare ground, and then you can subdivide into deciduous or evergreen trees or broadleaf and, and needleleaf. And for herbaceous, you can have C3 and C4. I like this because in the old way, the taxa classification is really who your ancestors are. And the physiognomic classification is basically what do you look like? The third is bioclimatic is, is where do you live? What neighborhood you come from? And the function of the NDVI classification to me is the meritocracy. It's really what you do, you know, how you use energy that matters. And this is the one that we use these days, the functional uh, classification uh, that bypasses your ancestry, your, what you look like, where you hang out, et cetera. And based on what you do, uh, that, that counts. So you are now familiar with the land cover classification based on the NDVI, just talk about herbaceous versus tree or shrub, and then evergreen versus deciduous and needle leaf versus, uh, needle leaf versus broadleaf vegetation. So uh, this is all familiar territory. I think, uh, I hope to all of you that the using the NDVI uh, for classification is to me, it's, it's not just useful, uh, but also uh, very pleasing in a different way. So if we go back here, when we did all these other classification, we have a desert, right? Desert is not a vegetation type. Desert is, you can talk about desert in terms of, of albedo. You can talk about desert in terms of, um, uh, in terms of, of of moisture content, but you really don't know what the photosynthetic capacity of a desert might be. So desert now would be a combination of whatever hangs out there, maybe herbaceous, maybe shrubs and a fraction bare ground. So the, the switch or the new functional def defining vegetation by functional groups actually allows us to put ecology um, into into our modeling, into our thinking in terms, in terms of CO2 water fluxes. So we have then the third topic I want to cover is how would CO2 and climate co-vary? So this is what used to be called the flying leap experiment. Now it is, uh, has a very proper grown up name called the couple C4 MIP, which is the coupled climate carbon cycle model in a comparison experiment. So basically we have, suppose there is warming, CO2 in the atmosphere could increase because warming enhances decomposition or something else, since it could decrease because warming may enhance photosynthesis um, and all these other and, and comparable things going on in the ocean. So at the, uh, so the last century, at the end of the last uh, century, we had this flying leap project. So we have the very simplistic view of the carbon cycle. Here's the atmosphere, it exchanges CO2 with the ocean, exchanges CO2 with the land. And prior to this flying leap experiment, all the climate models prescribe how CO2 and other greenhouses, greenhouse gases would increase in the atmosphere. So what we're doing the first round is to specify fossil fuel emission then let the terrestrial cycle, let the photosynthesis and decomposition carry on on land and then the gas exchange with the ocean. And so then what would be radiatively active in the atmosphere would be the residual um, after the land and ocean have taken their share. So we did a few, many experiments, but what is important, what I'll talk about here 
are the experiments where we specify the historical fossil fuel and um, and land cover, and then we have one where it's everything is interactive. All we specify is the is the fossil fuel CO2, and so then what I talked about is the the photo CO2 will enhance photosynthesis, and then the terrestrial carbon cycle kicks in, the ocean carbon cycle kicks in, and then the residual would be radiatively important, would be radiatively active. But we also did one where the the climate sees 283 ppm. Uh, uh, and so all we have is just the carbon cycle, but it's just re re responding to the CO2. But we also have one where the CO2 fertilization is off. So basically the biogeochemistry CO2, um, S gas exchange in the ocean. So this is like the old time was just uh, radiation uh, reacting to the fossil fuel carbon. So before we start, what we see in the, in the experiments, that's something that you all know by now is that there's a there's a correlation between perturbations in temperature and soil moisture. So positive correlation is where you have warmer and wetter, and mainly at high latitudes. And the negative correlation, the blue colors, the, the green blue colors, are where where it is warmer, it is dry. Okay, so this is this is something that we are now experiencing every day, uh, especially now in California. So when we look at the runs, then with the radiate, with the feedback, with and without climate feedback, what you see here is that the vegetation carbon uh, changes as well as soil carbon changes, and and. So we have warmer, drier, we would decrease uh, photosynthesis. There's less above ground biomass, and that would give less litter and faster decomposition because it is warmer and less uh, below ground. Where it is warmer, wetter, then there's increase in photosynthesis and more above ground biomass, more litter decomposition, et cetera. So this is, the, this is putting the global carbon cycle. So all of this is started with the NDBI, with the uh, understanding through the through the multiple decades now of NDBI, NDBI observations, how photosynthesis changes as a function of El Nino's and, and other climate perturbations, and how the CO2 would also respond to the changes in the land ecosystems, in the ocean gas exchange, et cetera, so that we can come up to now the coupled uh, carbon, coupled climate and carbon cycle uh, ca experiments. I want to end with this figure. This is Jim uh, with our old friend Pierre Sellers. The, when NASA in the early 80s, uh, when we all got together, NASA turned its eyes towards the Earth, and Pierre Sellers was our fiercest, fearless leader. So a lot of what I I presented to you was started in that in that uh, under Pierce leadership and under Jim's uh, good cheer. So I thank Jim again for a hell of a good time and for teaching me so much about ecology. So thank you very much. Thank you, and thank you, Inez. Let me switch over now to um, Scott. And you are now presenter, Scott. Okay, um, I'm still seeing Inez's uh, screen. Oh, here, if I click this, does that? Okay, show my screen. PowerPoint. Okay, do you see my uh, my slides? I do not yet. I do now. Okay. A presenter mode. Okay. So I uh, I hope you can see them. Inez, can you see my slide? It says the bad old days. I can see. Yes, I can see the slide, but they are in presenter mode. You have to swap screen. Oh, with, all right. On the upper. On the upper. Sorry. Okay. I have to get out of uh, presenter mode. Swap. I should have looked for that. 
when you were having the upper left on your upper left on your in powerpoint in powerpoint where the slides are uh-huh on the where where you want the the audience to see on the upper left there's a little arrow that goes around like that hmm. i think if you just hit present and put it into the sh um, show slides mode you'll be fine the okay. slideshow button uh, how's that you're still in the it's still, you still, see still in presenter mode. all right i'm not seeing this magic button that uh, ines is talking about at the top I think I may have to just go for it because I don't. Just go for it. Okay. Uh, let's see. How about... uh, all right. I'm just going to uh, going to go ahead and, and and tell my story here. Okay. So um, thank you very much. In in uh, a, a long time ago in this galaxy, um, when I was starting in graduate school. Uh, a lot of parameters in climate models uh, were, were set from, uh, let's call them off-the-shelf literature values by a method that is very similar to the paint-by-numbers method of painting. Uh, many of you will have seen kits like this where you fill in, uh, you know, red in the number six and so forth uh, to come up with a picture. And these these parameters were called lower boundary conditions to atmospheric models. So you might have a parameter that specifies the albedo and another one for the roughness length and another one for uh, soil properties and vegetation types and so forth. But there was absolutely no guarantee. In fact, it was almost guaranteed to, to not be um, biologically consistent among the different parameters. So you'd have one sort of paint by numbers set for albedo and another one for uh, vegetation, another one for soil. And uh, they, there was no uh, consistency among these because they were derived by different methods uh, by different people um, and published differently. Um, when NDVI became widely available, thanks to Tucker and Inez and others, um, one of the things that uh, that we noticed was that the leaf area index, the amount of leaves, the area of leaves per unit area of ground, um, is a saturating fun the NDVI is a saturating function of the leaf area index. That is, uh, when, when you have very few leaves, like as you go from a desert into a grassland into a, a sort of a savanna, you might see um, a, an increase in NDVI as the leaf area increases. But once you get beyond about four square meters of leaves per square meter of ground, uh, the, the LAI, uh, can increase more, but the NDVI is pretty much pegged. Uh, it really just means that the, the ground is green as seen from the vertical. Um, on the other hand, using a different way of scaling uh, the, the vegetation function, uh, the fraction of the light that is absorbed by the plant canopy is approximately linear with NDVI. And so this gives you a, a sort of stronger um, sensitivity of the uh, um, amount of absorbed radiation by canopies as a function of LAI, and it's much more useful uh, to use with, with satellite data. Looking at the vertical distribution of radiation in plant canopies, um, you can see uh, that, for example, a simple deciduous forest, you, you have most of the leaf area up here in the top of the canopy, and then sort of a stem area down below with very few leaves. Uh, you could have an understory with a second peak, um, but at, however you structure your canopy, you typically have a uh, near exponential fall off of light as you go down through the canopy, which is sort of the mirror image of the cumulative leaf area below a certain point. And so really we use this to define um, a, a sort of Beer's Law um, diffusive uh, cloud of leaves as Scott? sunlight penetrates. Dennis, was that you? Yes, Scott, I think you're not advancing your slides. We're still on the first slide. Oh, no, that's terrible. Oh, okay. Um, hmm. There you go. That's, it has not advanced to the seeing, fourth. Uh, okay, sorry. Uh, so can you see the slide now? I see slide two now. Can you see it says can huh. I see slide can be radiative transfer? Yes. Huh. Okay. Thank you. 
so thank you. Thank you for telling me. So um, the downward flux of sunshine through a plant canopy can be represented uh, as a sort of diffusive sponge, if you will, of, um, of chloroplasts, of, of absorbing uh, material. And so we can actually define a, an optical depth down through the canopy and use that as a vertical coordinate. Um, so Dennis, can you see a slide that says within canopy radiative transfer here? No, you have to advance to the next one. Yeah, I don't see slide three. You have to go to slide four. Yeah, I don't. I mean, it's it's doing that on my screen, but it's apparently not doing it um, on the webinar. I don't understand how that works. Uh, somebody tell me what the title of the slide that you see is. Canopy radio transfer. Slide three. Okay. Uh, and if I, uh, if I click that, you're not seeing the next, the next slide? No. no, we're not. Huh. I don't understand. Um, well, shucks. Uh, Continue on with your story. All right. Um, it would be nice to be able to see the slides. Uh, okay. So, um, when we try to implement the kind of uh, Calvin cycle photosynthesis that Inez described uh, in, in climate models, we need to scale the uh, photosynthesis and the transpiration up to landscape scales, up to the scales of, um, of climate models. And you might think that you could just multiply the amount of uh, carbon uptake or water loss by the number of square meters in a grid cell, but that would be assuming that the entire grid cell uh, what was exactly identical. And of course, that's not the case. And rather, the leaf level fluxes of water and carbon get scaled according to the stomatal conductance or the uh, um, area of the pore space that's exchanging gases between the inside of the plant and the outside of the plant. Um, as we try to integrate these fluxes upward, one of the, one of the key contributions of uh, Tucker and colleagues in the early 90s was realizing that the um, scaling of light down through the canopy and the function of plant stomates, the, the biophysics or you know, physiology of the, of the plant canopy was related to the, um, to the absorption of, of light down through the canopy. And in fact, this idea of an exponential decay of light down through the canopy uh, was, was absolutely critical. Um, it turns out that plants um, are pretty smart. After billions of years of evolution, they put their scarce nitrogen into proteins where it does the most good. That is, they put the most nitrogen where the light is greatest and the least nitrogen uh, where the light is least. Um, it looks like, Dennis, are you advancing my slides now? Somebody's doing something there. That's good. Um, so the, the canopy integration scheme was developed by Tucker along with, with Pierce Sellers and Joe Berry. And they, um, they showed that by distributing the photosynthetic capacity along the uh, vertical gradient of light down through canopies, um, you could integrate the photosynthesis and transpiration in the vertical uh, in closed form. So the key point here is that the treatment of, of uh, light through the canopy as an exponential allows you to integrate the exponential um, with a pencil and paper. And it leads to the finding that the, uh, the total F bar, the fraction of, of light absorbed by the canopy, which is itself linear with NDVI, is a perfect scaling factor to go from leaf level photosynthesis and leaf level transpiration up to canopy level or landscape level uh, photosynthesis and transpiration. So this fundamental uh, realization was the basis for a new set of um, climate models that were that were green, that were alive, that 
linked the parameters all together uh, using biology rather than the paint by numbers kind of approach uh, of the past. So um, now I can no longer see uh, whether there are any slides at all here. Um, I will continue. Um, the extension of this work into the 21st century has involved an amazing explosion of instrumentation in space, uh, including the ability to retrieve gas concentrations using uh, near-infrared spectroscopy. So the breathing of the Earth that Inez was talking about uh, a few minutes ago can be extended to global scale using low Earth orbiting satellites that uh, measure skinny little stripes of air. So we can tell how much carbon dioxide is in the air. We can tell how much carbon monoxide is in the air. Um, and then a uh, remarkable new advance in, uh, in this field was the discovery that the um, CO2 instrument that is, is, has been flying since 2014 uh, and actually other instruments as well are kind of by accident measuring the fluorescence of chloroplasts that are um, releasing some of their energy in a, a wavelength that's slightly longer than they absorb. So they absorb in the red about 680 or 700 nanometers, but they emit radiation uh, in, the, in the very close near infrared about 750 to 760 nanometers. So this is not reflected sunlight I'm talking about. This is actually the glow of life itself. Plants actually emit light um, as, a, as a byproduct of the photosynthetic uh, reaction. And that light is detected in orbit. Uh, and, and a remarkable set of new studies has come uh, to light in the last few years combining all of these kinds of remote sensing of the carbon cycle data. And it was made possible by the pioneering work that was done by Tucker and colleagues in the 90s, extended through the modeling work of Inez and colleagues like Joe Berry and Jim Kolatz uh, through the 90s and the aughts, and has now been uh, extended to uh, multi-sensor carbon data assimilation, where we bring together measurements of CO2, carbon monoxide, solar-induced fluorescence, um, and the spectral reflectance of plants to separately diagnose photosynthesis, respiration, decomposition, and biomass burning, and most recently to track the changes in these types of, of uh, metabolic parameters, metabolic processes across the whole planet through climate anomalies like El Nino. And, and so I uh, have some results at the end here. I won't be able to show you from a recent pic, uh, paper by Junji Liu and colleagues um, that uh, diagnosed the difference in, um, uh, during the 1920, sorry, 2015, 16 El Nino uh, compared to, the, um, to, to a non-El Nino period with the impact of uh, reduced photosynthesis due to drought increased respiration due to heat and the um, biomass burning, which leads to plumes of carbon monoxide. Actually, just amazing how this field has progressed from, as Inez is talking about the last century, uh, when Tucker was walking around with uh, radiometers in the prairie, to the current century where we're able to, to map uh, the breathing of the earth in great detail and uh, and uh, across time and space. So I'm terribly sorry that the slides didn't work out, but um, I think both of us would be delighted to take your questions. Thank you, Scott. Um, sorry about the technical uh, issues there. Um, let me bring Tucker and Inez back online. Um, Have a, I guess, let me start off with a question with, uh, to Inez. Um, in the way that we've seen advances um, in her system models and over your career from working with the sort of basic um, fluid dynamics um, of, of how climate models and ocean models were working at the time, atmospheric models, 
you've been part of the a great advancement of versus the modeling to where the biology is incorporated um, human activities through the, the, the fossil em emissions. Where do you see, I guess, the next steps or where, what questions are you asking about where the next steps in Earth system modeling um, should be pointed to? Um, and how do we guide the uh, research agencies in the way of, of addressing what you think are critical questions? I think I don't need to explain that water you know, this is our planet is the one with known three phases of water, um, and water is so central to all forms of life. And when I look at the ecology, uh, and since I'm in California, we are thinking all the time about the drought. And if you look at the drought, there's always differential mortality. Some trees die, you know, I've always asked the question, there are tree rings that tell me about thousand year droughts, okay? According to the climate model, they should be gone, okay? <laughs> and the CO2 gone back into the atmosphere, so why should they be standing there to tell us about thousand year droughts? So what I am seeing here is that on the land surface, I'm focusing on the land part, is that the very first, atmospheric model, the numerical weather forecast model, was a one-layer model of the atmosphere. That was Charney's model. Uh, Stommel's model of the Gulf Stream was a one-layer, is a barotropic model of the ocean of the Gulf Stream. We used to think that ice, the, the glaciers, would melt. Now we find, you know, in the atmosphere, these these little small aerially, in, you know, the clouds are what where the action is. In the ocean is the is the formation of the deep water and the intermediate, you know, all those little narrow, <laughs> narrow, narrow uh, fast exchanges in the in the in the vertical. Uh, over glaciers, we have the mullins. Okay, we used to just think things melt slowly like that, and now we see the mullins and the rapid, and how that could destabilize the glaciers. Now, when we come to land, there are also very fast, rapid exchanges. Okay, so we have the the roots. Okay, the the first there are fractures in the rocks. Uh, there are you if you look at um, uh, well data deep. You know, I'm saying 20 meters, not three meters, but if you look at 20 meters or so, there are wells. If if there are no fractures, if the way that we model them. Then the, through the rainy season, the well, the, the water table would increase monotonically. But what you find is these very rapid, very rapid fluctuations in the in the water table. So it rises, you know, this rapid rise after the rainstorm, and then there's some lateral flow. So there's a there's a there's a reservoir which is unexplored, or not well, I should not say unexplored, that is that that is not well explored okay and so the plants you know to me and this is when we were when when jim and i were on the ids team with tucker we were merged thanks to jim with the uh, hal mooney and other other people on the west joe and joe barry and chris field on the west coast and how would always there are roots that are 20 meters deep he came back from somewhere how would say they are deep roots you haven't got the deep roots so now I'm thinking that where you have fractures, where there is water, the, the roots will go, okay? And then where there's no water, the roots will die. And so then they have access to the, they have access to the deep water. And so to me, maybe it's the geology, the lithology that says, you know, who has secret, secret source of water, okay? And then the other thing is that the, 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 the hydraulic redistribution, so the tap roots can suck up some, many tree species can do that. And so you have fast down, okay, through the fractures, and then you have fast up through the root system. So there's a whole reservoir. What I'm trying to say is that when we look at ecology, there's a whole reservoir all the way down, okay, to I'm saying 20 meters or somewhere, <laughs> okay, that could sustain trees, could, could sustain productivity through droughts, um, etc. So when we did a fairly simple sensitivity calculation, 
that's something <laughs> you know you, you can assume i don't have root data so so you can do all these these sensitivity calculations suppose i have an exponential root profile to 10 meters 10 percent of 90 percent of the roots mass is about four meters so it's between four and ten that ten percent is always <laughs> okay that does all the work that, that sucks up that has access to the deep water okay so it is not you know i kept saying when we do geostrophy uh scott you know that you know the wind the geostrophic wind if you count the kinetic energies all the kin it's like the society right the <laughs> the masses of the money is in a small fraction, but they do no work. Okay, so they do no work. So the 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 work is done by small fraction of the of the root mass. Okay, that that, that minority fraction. So to me, the whole thing of water is a big question, and water is so crucial to life, uh, and how how we how we survive the quality of the water not just the amount of water so to me that's an that's a that's a continuing frontier yeah no it, it's it goes back to my first interaction with Pierce sellers in manhattan kansas when we did uh the international land surface experiment there in on the manhattan project in manhattan kansas where the the, the forecast model for how the flights were set up the best model was the European model. And the simple reason why is that they had a straw that connected the land surface to the atmosphere that exchanged water vapor. And it was interesting at that time, it, the biology and in in the forecast models are so poor, but having that simple connection improved the forecast of our flights each, each day. And that interaction of ecologists, um, of atmospheric scientists of you know flight planners you know and, and, and Pierce's insight about connecting all this was really essential and since then you know that water vapor the water connection um, is really critical I've had conversations with Scott in the days when he was working with the the the, uh, the CSU um, with Randall's model where the the, the role of subsurface water was not represented at all and trying to throw irrigation into a model it it it, it violated the, the very physics of the model so um you know the work that you know scott's done in improving that and working in the tropics i think has really been helpful i think i have a question then for, related to you sky about in your work of looking at teleconnections uh between you know the work that you did with um, um lba and the the land biosphere experiment out of the Amazon that really did teach us a lot about some of these slow and fast variables in the carbon cycle and it's sort of its influences um, not only on um, energy exchange but carbon exchange that then connects the world. Yeah, thanks. The um, uh, kind of an amazing thing. Uh, many people had developed land surface models, uh, vegetation models, the kind of uh, thing that you were just describing uh, in Kansas at Fife. Um, Harvard Forest was an early place that was very, very well observed uh, with flux towers. And in the late 90s, a bunch of us took these um, land vegetation models that were developed in the in the temperate zone and um, dropped them into the middle of the Amazon and bad things happened. Uh, they, they tended to um, be unable to sustain transpiration and photosynthesis through a four month dry season. Um, you know, in Massachusetts, the leaves fall off this time of year and you can go all winter long without any leaves. But in, in the Amazon, uh, you've got this, you know, tremendous tree canopy 365 days a year and the observations show that it continues to transpire and, and photosynthesize all through the dry season. And just as Inez was talking about, uh, a lot of that has to do with deep roots, with uh, perhaps 10% of the roots that, that are way the heck down there and, and uh, soaking wet and able to transport water in the vertical. Uh, we found that uh, by, by looking at um, uh, rainfall exclusion, where, where uh, tremendous amount of effort to, to put up um, plastic roofs, gutters in the forest over 10 hectares. 
uh, to, to divert the throughfall uh, away from the forest, you could measure the progressive changes in drought stress over these landscapes over a period of years. Um, conversely, uh, there's places where people have done experiments uh, watering the understory in the dry season. Uh, these kinds of, of experiments just revolutionized the way that, that uh, these models treated uh, tropical ecosystems. Yeah, you know, uh, now in the 21st century, we're we're faced with the idea of um, modeling not just the function of of whole ecosystems of plants, but uh, their lives and deaths. You, you know, reproduction, mortality. These kinds of of things really aren't in the Calvin cycle or the uh, Balberry equations. But when when uh, climate changes out from under a forest. Um, the, the way that manifests is actually through death. Uh, you, you've got to start um, actually treating, treating the uh, so, sort of individual life cycle of organisms um, to, to be able to, to do these kind of threshold events like, like forest dieback. So we've still got a long way to go. Um, it's, a, it's been an amazing 30 years to, to watch the science develop. Um, but uh, you know we're not there yet. We, we've got a ways to go. I have to say that um, Jim Tucker took us global. You know, ecology took us global, and then we went. We did all the global models, etc., CO2 around the world. At the end of the day, we come back to something very local and something very small scale. Mm -hmm. Okay, the plant hydraulics inside the plant. Okay, the leaves and 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 what kind of you know what kind you know its adaptation to the to the uh, where it came from you know the source where the seeds were grew up you know etc so so i think that it is to me it's exciting okay we went you know jim took us around the world okay <laughs> and we when, when we saw the green wave and i have to say for the students there that my first proposal the reviewer said Ms. Fong is so naive, she doesn't look out the window. Okay, then, then the NDPI came out, uh, and then there was no, I don't care. <laughs> okay, what species that is out there? There is the, the green wave, and you can see that, you know, what I said is the function that counted. But now, okay, so that, so now we're coming back. We've got the global view, and now we're back, zooming back down to how. So the plants, how do plants function? Mm. Okay, what is the physiology? What is the hydraulics and okay, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a lot more to learn, especially for me. Tucker gave us a bigger window. <laughs> I, although um, thinking about the carbon cycle and, and being you know partly a soil scientist as well, a general ecosystem scientist, I think there are aspects of the soil profiles and the decomposition side of things that um, are a underrepresented in our uh, in our models that we need to pay attention to and although we have uh, a good superficial view of the earth system with remote sensing how do we actually delve into you know you you, you mentioned that with the roots but in addition to roots, we have microbes, soil profiles, and slow pools of carbon that are rapidly changing because of climate change, other disturbance patterns that we need to, I think, incorporate in our system model. And and I think I'm thinking back to Kathleen Tresseter's thesis at Jasper mm -hmm. Ridge, where higher CO2 is a totally different population uh, of microbes. Uh, in the soil. Okay, so whether that would decompose, I have no clue. You know, there's a lot of interesting questions that have been opened up. Yeah, traditionally, you know, the, the models that we've been discussing um, up until the last five years or so, the, the global models, biogeochemistry models, have treated decomposition uh, pr pretty much like you would do radioactive decay, right? There's a, there's a time constant or a you know, turnover time that's associated with each pool. And maybe you tweak the, the turnover times a little bit depending on temperature and moisture. But the real decomposition is, is biology. It's, it's somebody eating somebody and, and uh, food webs and nutrient cycles and um, you know, population explosions of different kinds of um, 
microbial functional types. So that, that stuff's only now really being incorporated into, for example, the community earth system model uh, and uh, other models like that um, for the first time. And also, I think that what we've not, you know, we even with the NDBI and we're saying, you know, we have the plant functional types, there are, there are synergies between certain species. And I've read old forestry papers, you know, the, the, in the Pacific Northwest that first are commercially important. And then they, and the Pacific Madrone sort of taking up space. And so when they grew them with the, et cetera, et cetera, the multiple combinations, the, the bottom line is that the duck first grew better in the soils where the Pacific madrones have been or in the vicinity of the madrone. So now you can tell, you know, I, I'm now going to the, the storytelling part. Like I give you the duck fur can, can do the hydraulic redistribution. I give you water and you give me the, the biogeochemistry, the right soil, right? So there's a synergy. I'm making this up. I have no data. But I can see from the data, I, I can see from the data that, um, that there's another dimension that we have. The reason I'm thinking in terms of species and locations is not just a climate issue. People talk about planting trees as a as a way to remove CO2 from the atmosphere. So what trees, what species, where do you where where do you plant them? Uh, you know, and here when, when Abby started her work, our colleagues were gonna plant poplars. And we said, no way, no way, because poplars will will pump water like crazy. They grow fast, and I say they grow fast because they pump water like crazy. So there's a whole new set of questions that come in, okay, that, that, that take us back to the individual level, to the very local level, you know, the global, global context and the local action. Uh, so, so to me, there's a, there's a lot, there's a whole new, whole new set of questions out there that we are, we, I don't know how to I'm learning from the new, the, the new people. You know, from, a, from a academic perspective where, you know, I, we've been struggling with maintaining an interdisciplinary um, educational system and developing new researchers, young re early career researchers in a way that they can look at these as systems not get so narrowly focused on one solution or one discipline and i think all of us have evolved in our careers to be interdisciplinary researchers and, and i'm not sure exactly why because but it, it's sort of been part of the questioning and innovation that we've always been striving for um i, I in our conversation earlier Inez, you, you, you talked about big science is not as, is thinking big, not being part of a big team. you it, it, interested to hear everyone's kind of perspective on how big science happens. And maybe I'll start with you, Inez. Well, I think, you know, what we talked about is that I was not objecting to big science i am advocating discovery science and discovery science could be somebody sitting sitting off doing something uh weird okay that turns out to be <laughs> transformative later on or it could be like what what i so much enjoyed with jim and with pierce and with dave randall and the young and the young kid scott denning uh, the, and everybody together that was challenging because we have different different jargons, different language. And it was very difficult to just sit there and stare at one another. <laughs> okay, <laughs> and I don't know what you, you know, I would prefer to go to the board and write an equation. No, I can't do that. Okay, so, so, so it takes a while and it's been written so many times that the interesting questions are the boundaries. Okay, new perspectives, new insights, etc. So group, you know, whether you call it big science or group science, okay, where you can find a group of 
of colleagues to learn from one another. And when you, you know, what I found for me uh, is that five to eight PIs would be about what I, my brain can absorb. Five would be better than eight, but <laughs> beyond that, there, there's very little conversation. And you have to build it through time so that there has to be trust that I can ask you a question, okay? What is Rubisco? Okay, I can't spell it. I don't know what it is. Can you write me an example? No. Okay, <laughs> but you know, so there's a lot of there's a lot of learning that has to come through, and so in that learning, you have to trust one another to ask the yeah. question. You have to trust one another, uh, and it helps when you're having a good time. You have you like the people you are hanging out with, and you're having a good time while you're learning. Uh, so I've been very lucky to be part of that with with Jim and with Piers and with Dave and Joe and everybody else on that uh, IDS team. Sorry. I would not dare do it on my own. I mean, I, I would have just dropped. You know, the dictionaries are very heavy. That was it. Okay. I I, I joined the team that Inez is talking about with with Tucker and Piers and Chris Field and so forth. Um, in 1990, uh, I was a brand new graduate student, and um, really, it was uh, pr some of the best years of my life to, to be able to work with these people. Um, Pierce had a had a saying: "No show, no dough." So, you know, if you didn't come to the meetings, uh, he didn't send you send your university the check. Um, and we had these wonderful meetings every six months. Um, where, where we would uh, sit down and, and work through the remote sensing and the modeling and the comparing to experiments and trying to code, we would actually debug code, you know, around the table uh, and, and see results uh, in front of us. Uh, I don't know whether it's big science or, or little science, but it was certainly discovery science. I, I think there's a role for big science because if, if it weren't for, you know, big organizations like NASA, we wouldn't have these uh, these windows in space that we can use to look down at the surface and, and um, map things in, in dozens of different wavelengths. Um, but by itself, the satellite data is agnostic. It doesn't know anything. It's just a bunch of numbers. You, you have to have people putting their heads together and talking to each other and, and struggling with what the hell does it mean uh, in, in order to bring out uh, understanding about, about how nature works. But I have to come back to Tucker and the first NDBI, okay? For him, for Tucker, the postdoc, to go down to NOAA headquarters and say, your, your pants are stupid. And then for Tucker, and I remember Jim, okay, Jim, I remember uh, at Goddard, it was a snowstorm and Corey was with you. Jim was processing the data the tapes and everything himself, right? So that's not big science. Okay, so that's why I'm not advocating big science as a, a term. I'm advocating discovery science, whether it's done by an individual like Jim, when he was a postdoc in early, early career at, uh, at Goddard, okay? Or a team that grew out of what he's done, et cetera. So without Jim doing his single-minded <laughs> Lone Ranger type of stuff uh, at Goddard, uh, there's no big science to follow. You're here. So, Jim, you have the last word. So, thank you, Inez. Uh, I hope everyone realizes sometimes if you believe in something, you have to see it through and you have to be willing to take a lot of ridicule, have people tell you you're really stupid. Everyone knows what you're talking about won't work. But um, I think all of us here today, Scott, Inez and Dennis and myself realize that can be very encouraging because if you have confidence in what you're doing, if you are, if you try and be critical, you'll usually succeed. Now, the answer which you obtain uh, uh, and being successful may be somewhat different from where you started, but you will have learned in the process. And don't be discouraged by people who try and tell you this won't work, this is really stupid. Everyone knows this is nonsense. Uh, just ignore that and proceed and, and apply the scientific method in a quantitative way, and uh, you'll stumble upon something very useful. With that, um, we have to close up the session today.
Um, in three weeks' time, we'll have uh, Matt Larson, uh, Matt, I'm sorry, Matt Hansen, and and Tom Tim Tucker um, on talk, uh, talking about um, land uh, cover uh, discrimination uh, and looking at uh, fragmentation and forest cover analyses um, at this webinar. So thank you all again. Um, Okay. And we'll see you in three weeks' time. Bye. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye.